Hello there and welcome to the Caps Unlocked post ESL 1 Hamburg podcast. My name is Nomad and I'm here with the man who casted Epicenter alongside me and a man who has been to many other events since as well as uh, Dream League and uh, recently had pretty good time in uh, Ukraine with Maincast. His name is Killer Pigeon. How's it going, dude? One second... Ukraine, please. Sounds like now we can hear you. So good fun and lots oh, of hangovers. Oh, we can hit. Okay, yeah, there you go. That's that's, that's a good <laughs> summary. Easy, easy. All right, and also joining me is Mr. B Copperman, who's done WESG Epicenter as well as uh, many, many qualifiers. Uh, the most casts last year out of anybody in the Dota 2 scene. Benjamin B Cop, how's it going? Good. It's uh, you know, getting there. It's almost November. Have some good Dota on the way. Dream League. And then we have uh, the KL Major, so it's, you know, with ESL, it's starting to really ramp up, and I'm excited for that. I love that. 
yeah was... absolutely absolutely there's a lot going on and uh, we are in the middle of it all but we want to talk about um esl one hamburg which obviously it just ended with that finals secret did end up taking its commissaries uh, uh b cup uh who are you guys uh, rooting for in that grand final hey, uh, you know she yeah, it's, he's clearly beachy. <laughs> um, I'm clearly on the secret bandwagon, okay? You know, you got to give some love there. Not just for Zai being back on free, but just... I always love watching some... Especially some Yapsaw. Yapsaw is the one that always gets me. Along with mid one just being this guy that... The only way I can actually summarize him is probably the most selfless mid I've seen on the tier one scene. And it does so much for his team. All right, so walk me through those grand finals very, very quickly. We, we'll, we'll get to the deeper analysis later on, but like, what was it like uh, watching those grand finals for you? It was... Honestly, I thought Vici was going to... There were definitely times where it looked like they were going to win game one. That one was back and forth. Had they won that game, they could have even 3-0'd this series, but, I mean, that's that's the best part of Dota, almost, is the fact that they lose game one, they take the next two games, and then you're like, oh, well, Vici's got all this momentum, they're going to go into game four, they're going to just sweep it out, it's going to be easy. And then 33-minute game, Secret win game four, they win game five on what wasn't even close to a nail-biter. I mean, Secret, they really calmed it down. I, I, if you lose two games like that and barely scrape by in game one, where your head's at, to me, seems like it should be all over the place but they focused and they won games four and five really quickly and and almost both games being heavily one-sided it was great <laughs> pigeon what about you how, how'd you find it i mean that's kind of the thing right like we saw these really interesting kind of comebacks occur in the first few games it, was, it wasn't too close of course vici were getting it predominantly and yeah just swings in the end it's kind of weird because you know you can argue burnout right but burnout should have been on secret side secret they played dominantly and quickly against, you know, VP and stomped them very convincingly. So it wasn't the longest series for them. But it's not easy for a team to actually recover like that. Like, and that, that's kind of the difference is actually this level is how you control your morale. Because, you know, when, when you get to this level, you, over the years, there's been things, you go back a few years, it was about how captains uh, manage to outdraft each other and how they keep timings on ultimate. And it's like, we are getting so high level in this scene now while you might catch someone out with a brew support pick first, very quickly they adapt. And, you know, we saw that, I think it was, um, we saw brew support, and then they tried to trick Vici and change it to be a core, but suddenly Vici was like, no, 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 we're not falling for this anymore. So it's like, it's very hard. I think you get to a stage where Vici was so convinced they were going to win it that you kind of don't see the clear path in front of you. You get two steps ahead of yourself. Right. And up against a team like Secret, they see the opportunity, they take it in an instant, and all of a sudden, you're on the back foot. All right. Uh, yeah. Th thanks for the uh, nice run through with the grand finals. I mean, f for me, you know, I thought game one and two were really close, really fun games to watch. And then uh, three and four, you know, I was like, well, you know. And I mean, I was kind of voting for Seeker, but I was just kind of watching it for the good Dota. And wow, that that last uh, moment, that that like RP from Zai. And then, you know, I thought that was like kind of the game deciding, the tournament deciding moment, because once that came out, you kind of go, okay, you know, game fives, they can often be a bit momentum based and Team Secret just found their momentum behind that one play. Absolutely crazy. What, what do you guys both think about that? I, I want to hear uh, Beacup's thoughts on uh, that Roshan. You know, Zai just comes in, RPs them all. They're almost lining up for it. What do you think was going through the heads of Vichy when that was happening? Uh, I mean, they got hit with that arcane curse first, so it's just like they knew something was coming. You knew it was that if there was an arcane curse, you have to assume that everybody's there. You're in the Roche pit, but it was so low. The Roche was so low, you have to commit. You back out there, and then all of a sudden, you just give up the Roche. It, it, it kind of maybe you fight afterwards and you take a better fight, but they, I guess, their game plan was to completely commit, and, and then Zai just comes in and. Unfortunately, he doesn't win a Mercedes with that RP, but that was <laughs> definitely uh that that changed. You could tell it changed the whole thing after that play. Vici got sloppy, and it just it it fell apart because they were in control of the momentum of that game, and and that RP changed everything. Yeah. And uh, as a Vici fan, uh, well, as a Chinese Dota fan, you you could just feel hearts sink. All yeah. over the eastern <laughs> area. Zai yeah, RP'd a lot of hearts today. <laughs> oh yeah, that's there's going to be a, a comic there for sure. Alrighty, well, um, 
obviously the Magnus coming out, um, a couple of all the other big players throughout that Grand Finals were definitely the Phoenix and the Sansa, but I want to talk about the meta development through the tournament as a whole, because we had these kind of... Um, obviously with every tournament you know what what you're picking at the start doesn't line up with what you're picking at the end so what were the main ones coming through which uh, you kind of noticed uh pigeon start with you i mean i i think it's like brewmaster is the definitive go-to one that we look at right it's, it's just it's more or less the, no one actually envisioned this as a support right it's always been a core and it's kind of funny because if you think about it we should have seen it coming to an extent there's been other ones that have taken this approach phoenix is the most dominant one is for a long time, this was this was an offlane hero. You only play in the offlane. It's the only way you play it, right? Occasionally, you might see some trolley mid, but it was always cool. Then suddenly, it starts becoming a POS 5, and people go, oh, how? It's so greedy. Omni Knight was the same way. And it's like, if you think about what Brew really wants, he just wants levels. And while you can suffer and be a level or two behind, you know you're going to get that power spike, and it's so high. So that was actually the, other, the one big one. The other big one, which has been kind of floating around for a while, but hasn't really... It's only recently really started to solidify is Coswex Invoker. Uh, for a long time, Invoker was the bane of a pick for a team because all it done is it just basically was this guy in the mid lane that you had to pick heroes in the outer lanes that enabled it, right? Like he needed a, a way to hit his, his uh, sun strikes all the time. Then suddenly you come to present day and Invoker is making all the space across the map. And I think what mid one and certain other mids have really shown us in this tournament is that there is still room to have this mid that isn't just a farm and carry. It's actually this active person, like a few years back with Tux and Queen of Pains, where they rotate around, they find all these kills. I think that's the biggest thing to kind of focus on in the next coming months, is if that latches on further, and if we start to see more justification for active mids versus farming mids. Okay, that's interesting. I thought you were going to go and tell us that uh, you were thinking Invoker was going to be the new five position switch out there. I was like, oh I mean, God. He's been, he, he, he's been in the dream. support role, right? A long time ago, he was in the support role. I mean, yeah. I avoided talking about Ursa support and how that was justified. Yeah, now, that might start to resurge again. But it's like, I, love I think Ursa the, support. it's great, right? But there's like, it's the same with troll support because the whole Orb of Venom interaction with arranged melee. But like, the problem when you pick these type of heroes, and even to extend Brew, but it luckily recovers due to that six is these are brawler type supports that don't really give you a buffer to a teammate like an ogre. They are all in. If you start to fall behind, an Ursa support does not know what to do anymore. Yeah. Really problematic. Yeah, uh, Tiny as well. Yeah, similar basket. Yeah, right? Tiny definitely to an extent. It's like Tiny can have relevance because he's, got that, he's essentially got a save when you think about it. Is not many support players use it this way, but a few who have really stood out over the last few months are these ones that will just blink in and toss someone out, save them, right? It's like a makeshift dazzle where you know you're going to die, but it's like, whatever, I kept my Terra Blade alive or, or whoever else, maybe your Ember with a Rapier. It can be a deciding hero. But if an Ursa blinks in, goes, I'm going to save you. All right, how are you going to save me? I'm going to kill them all. Ursa, you only take one target at a time. Oh, set, pause the game. I'm going to all chat, ask them if they can queue up. You know, it's it's <laughs> yeah. pretty much that type of scenario. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a Weaver, of course, which uh, I'm kind of more of a four position, but yeah, Weaver Ags is some interesting. <laughs> I think it's really, really good, but obviously, you know, you kind of uh, base yourself around one thing. Anyway, uh, Beacup, what's your, what's your, uh, which hero have you been keeping an eye on this tournament? I like the Weaver four. Um, that showed up a lot in the Chinese Dota that uh, the Chinese region during a lot of these qualifiers and yeah, smaller yeah. leagues, just having it with. Getting that first level Ags. I know Aster played it a lot. Bobica on that position for Weaver. Um, you know, maybe not in this tournament, but he has been impressive. I remember him uh, maybe a month ago going position four Weaver. All of a sudden was top of the net worth with Diffusal and Ags and took over the game. Uh, a lot of these Chinese teams, they love to play like this kind of four fight until the position one is ready to go. And what... Uh, KP was saying with the Invoker being like this mobile hero, like they love playing, that. especially D Stone's mid for uh, Team Master. They love the mobile Invoker, but Weaver Four is just like I I love how he's mobile. I love the Ags. It's such a such a good save at times, and we saw it in the finals as well. That it was just such a an interesting way to get these saves. I, I think Lena's getting a little bit more popular mid. Uh, obviously, Lena you know, was popular mid, but I feel like it's taking that even more of a, you want that burst damage, you want someone who's mobile as well, gets that Yules early to make sure you can land that stun. So Weaver, Lena, 
is is pretty up there and then ogre just you know i'm just coos i just i just walk at you and i'm ogre and that's it <laughs> i and hate that era I, hey, yeah well he, he doesn't do anything he just runs at you. exactly like he's, he's, he's just <laughs> hi i'm a support oh by the way i have like what it's like six armor and like seven health region oh right okay so whatever you do you're gonna be a good hero like man he's like is it not eight i think it's eight and then usually they just go i'm gonna pick up a ring of protection uh, yeah. um we're not attacking oh, him guys just yeah. ignore him move around him He's just this, this blob, which doesn't, it's not like a normal hero because you don't actually bother attacking it because you don't want to waste your right clicks. You could be doing something more important. Oh, I mean, man, I get legit out. feel like the only, like, people keep talking about Ogre's getting a nerf. Ogre's getting... The only nerf you actually need to give Ogre is you take away his gold talent. Like, that's it. Yeah, Literally yeah, the, go, the gold talents are so important. Like, people are just, like, I've talking to a few people and they're just like, you know, every time you're trying to analyze, like, a 4 or 5 position, they're just like, oh, well, uh, yeah, that hero is really good and everything. You know, it can change a game around, but it doesn't have a gold talent, therefore it just pales yeah. in comparison to the others. Just, oh, all right, then. It's, is that it's easy? Like people go, oh, yeah, you got a farmer mechanic. Do you have a gold talent, though? Yeah. No? Or <laughs> Farming without away hitting from, creeps. But you're taking gold away from other people. We can't have that. You're going to be a pulse 4 or 5. <laughs> uh, it, is, it really is. It's like a few months back. I mean, I was talking to Liz about this a lot, and he was like, it was like, would you say if you're gonna think about picking a support, it has to have a gold talent? You went, yep. Like, that, I'm pretty sure that's how everyone's feeling right now. Is it's it puts Delta in a weird scenario. The talents were needed. The talents are very good, especially the way they accelerate the late game. But I just feel like GPM talents are possibly the most broken thing right now. Um, problem is, you take them out of the equation, then we just get into a discussion about movement speed talents, which are also insane. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say, are they going to go the way of movement speed talents where it's just like, that's it, take them out? Or do they get, do you think maybe they get like halved or something? Or is that too much too? Do you remember the I days? Think... Sorry, go on. I was going to say, the problem is like GPM versus whatever is a very um, kind of black and white way of looking at Dota, if that makes sense. I like these kind of talent choices that really commit you to a different style of play. Yeah. So a perfect example is Ember Spirit at 25. Is you get double slide of fists or you get remnant cooldown. And that is actually really cool because suddenly you're tailoring to two different styles of Ember completely, right? Is the big fat crits, rapier picking up Ember who's just gonna double slide of fist and kill everyone. And then there's these super mobile ones with the Shiva's guard, the Octarine just jumping around like a madman. It's like I like those type of choices. I would like those ones that kind of have substance and impact. Right? It's like we took this idea, we essentially this idea of talents was taken from Heroes of Storm. And Heroes of Storm was very interesting that, that way because you essentially that was the only way they could change the characters over the levels. And so you kind of had these paths that you started to carve your way down that really changed the way the hero functioned as the game went on. Do you remember the uh, death talents, the death timer cooldown? Talents? Those were terrible. Those were absolutely terrible. <laughs> Five and second it... death timer. Yeah. <laughs> Like, what, what okay. was it? I think Phoenix had one that was just ridiculous, and then the Lone Druid, Druid was one. crazy. Lone Druid, Lone Druid was Ugh. insane because you just get to late games, like, okay, I've been dead for 20 seconds. I've got a Bill and Bloodstone that never loses charges. Baby, let's go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just completely unreasonable. Game? Completely unreasonable. Could you uh, imagine that? Because people are sometimes dead for 140 seconds with Necro so popular right now. But he's like, ah, no, it's only 40 seconds. Dude, I hate, <laughs> like, like, that's not even getting a, 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 like a, a subject of why Necro still is the way he is because. There should not be a respawn altering aspect like that. that that's just, Agreed. It doesn't take away buyback. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, but that was even more <laughs> ridiculous. It, it doesn't matter. It, it's still ridiculous to a stupid degree, right? They nerfed yeah. Doom into the ground, and he was like a kind of one-dimensional hero. And you can argue Necro is really sophisticated with Ghost Shroud and the way you kind of dominate the late. Yeah, but in the end, I'm still just going to walk up to someone on half HP, slap a siphon in their face and say, ha, enjoy your extra time, your extra two or three creep waves that are going to be missed, PL. Or whoever else it is you're jumping on. Yeah, Usually PLs, because screw those guys. And you're the PL, and you're just like, all right, well, I guess I'm going to start life writing my life <laughs> memoirs whilst I'm dead for the next half of it. Yeah. I mean, I've had this. I recently just started opening Darkest Dungeon or something. I'll be yeah. back soon, guys. <laughs> I mean, the, the key thing, though, the bottom line for this, right, is that at the very end of the day, ignoring competitive aspects, ignoring, like, everything else, a game is made to, like, be played and have fun. And you want to take, like, any time you're sitting out of the game has to be for a highly specified reason for example if you're dead late game you need to be dead for a while you can accept that but necrophos is just 
it's it's just a load of rubbish. I don't know. We should we should we should start an activism group, guys. I think we should go and like camp outside Pro Valve HQ with signs. Protest. Saying, what do we want? Necrophos to be reworked. <laughs> when do we want it? Next no. patch. <laughs> Which but will be whenever you. that is. Yeah. yeah, whenever that is. We're stuck in uh, 7.19 for who knows <laughs> how long it's been. I think uh, I might have been a year younger, maybe two years younger. It feels like. I, I, just, I you I'm know. know. I'll, I'm gonna slap my hands down on the table. I'm saying, you know what, Valve? Drop the patch in the minor. No, no. I don't care that it's official DPC event. Those guys already, all of them are there already lost once, okay? So they're trying to get to the major. This is the additional punishment. This this is the spin, baby. This is where we make things different. We go, bam. You don't know what's going to happen here. We're going to change all the heroes up. Everything you practice, gone, right? Fire all of a sudden, All of a sudden, complexity just threw because E's stupid carry support logics work even better because no one understands what the hell is going on with Axe or anyone else anymore. Axe <laughs> Ax is such a great hero right now. I love it. And I love when he gets uh, double stout shield. That's like one of my favorite things to watch. When uh, Bobica gets double stout, and I know I mention him all the time, but he's like the guy who gives me these highlights in my head, but he, he goes double <laughs> stout in he's five in minutes as a vanguard, and then has boots and blink at like 10 minutes. I totally cost that, and he just goes, yeah, that never happened. I go, it happened? I swear to God. He goes, no, no, no that, that didn't happen. <laughs> like, it, it just did. He's, he's like, it's just impossible. It, it, it's such, it, you have no answer when it's played the right way, and it's crazy. And I want to see more of it. I want to see more double stout. Give me more double. All right. Well, since, since you mentioned Asta, that can segue us quite nicely into our next section, which is what were your favorite teams? Who did you have to win uh, coming into this tournament? Because uh, for me, I had my money on Asta actually. This uh, after after yeah after like watching them through the qualifying, I was like, yeah, screw it. These guys can these guys can go all the way. I don't think people are going to see them coming. They're they're going to be the underdogs. No, no, everybody's going to under underestimate them. And Asta might pull off a, a magical win. So that was my team coming in. I'll talk about um, why they got eliminated a little bit later on. But I want to hear you guys. So uh, uh, let's, let's just jump back to Ben. Is it, is it Asta for you or is it someone else? No, it was actually Vici. Um, watching Asta recently had kind of lowered their stock, in my opinion, because I had been watching D-Stone a lot. And I've been watching games where XSS and Silar would have these amazing games and D Stones would had to had to heavily rely on them having good games to perform as well as he could. And it felt like it was such a weak point mid for them. Like even when he got D Stones Invoker, everybody's always like, oh my god, D Stones has got an invoker. Like, this is great. He'd go like four and eight, and it wouldn't be this performance that you're expecting from someone who's so good at invoker. And I thought when you have such a weak link like that mid, and I don't think he, you know, he should be dropped or anything. I, I think he can learn from an experience like this. It's just not going to be a tournament winning uh, endeavor for them. And I thought Vici looked way cleaner, way better. Uh, they really got things to start the ball rolling. They were up 2 1 in a final. They almost did it. But uh, yeah, they, <laughs> they looked. Uh, I, I had Vici to win it. If it had to be a Chinese yeah. team, I thought it was going to be Vici. And I really did think that they were going to come out of there victorious. I see your points, but it's interesting because what you put as positives, I put as negatives. I think like the, the, the reason that they play so tight and so kind of predictably almost you know they just play classic dota they don't really stray from the rule book much and for me that's that's a negative but yeah obviously you know they did nearly win so it's obviously a pretty good thing that they're doing uh what about you pigeon who are your favorite team coming into uh hamburg i mean you know if we were to go by the logic you just gave i was going to go over lines but because they're like they they do play by the rule book right they just play this normal dota that they've known for years and no they completely let me down I didn't expect them to win, at least expect them to get halfway through. I think top was definitely Team Secret and Virtus Pro. Virtus Pro, because, come on, you got, like, these guys look stupidly dominant in the main cast tournament. Yes, it's not the same caliber of teams consistently that we're seeing at ESL, but it was the way they handled them. And yeah. then the other case for Secret is, like, well, mid one just came off a long break. He's got to be feeling good. He's got to be feeling relaxed. There's no pressure here. This is a a non-official event. There's no points for TI at stake here. They're just going to play some Dota. And that's, that's what Puppy said. We just, like, we just, you know, we just came, we experimented. Experimentation isn't bad. Like he's just in his second year in a French university or something. Wink, <laughs> wink. Um, but yeah, like Fruity. VP is just, you got to have VP on your list at some point, right? Like they won all these ESL. It's like, I'm going to do it again. And yeah. you remember. And it's oh, not TI, it's so. <laughs> Wait, this one is yeah. not a major though. Oh, there we go. They're going to lose. Yeah, as long as the tournament is not called the international, 
the Virtus Pro is always up there in terms of being a favorite. So what you're saying is I need to invite, like I need to get a small tournament together, call it something in the national. I invite VP, get yeah. all the sponsors' money. VP lose. <laughs> <laughs> get yeah. that valuable like Reddit Twitch clips coming in. Yeah, <laughs> easy money making schemes. All right, so you you did mention Alliance. So I want to talk about um you know what led to them getting knocked out of the tournament, but we'll we'll give you a little bit of time to to recover. <laughs> uh, first. Uh, the other kind of surprise team that got knocked to the group stages was, of course, NIP, which is PPD's team, uh, ending up on actually getting 2 owed um, by Complexity, I believe, um, in in their final, which was the big upset, which actually led to them leaving. So uh, did you watch that series, Speak Up? Uh, no, there was a couple series that I just couldn't get into because it was at 6, 7 in the morning for me. So I was still True. in my uh, nappy times as I'm over here in uh, New York. But <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, when I saw it, all the results, Ninjas in Pajamas, 3 and 7 in the group stage, and 9 and 1 for Aster. Like, I didn't think they were going to win Group B. I thought they would do well, but I didn't think they were going to win. And I don't know if anybody really expected Complexity to make it out of groups. I thought a lot of people had their money on Complexity and Evos getting knocked down the group stage. and. I don't know what's happening with Ninjas in Pajamas because they have looked like a top five team at times. And then all of a sudden you get into this group stage for ESL and it's like, well, you're limited. That's it. <laughs> it was really surprising. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really kind of, yeah, caught me off guard at NIP, especially with PPD as a captain. And, you know, like, it, I don't know. It's just mad that they, they didn't make it through. But um, Complexity pulling out the last minute win and then uh, not doing very well in the uh, in the actual main group either so for better or for worse uh we did we did not see nip but um yeah pigeon talk me through the defeat of alliance what went wrong for them uh they are predictable they kind of always been predictable it was just i was surprised the other teams given how long they've been ignoring it caught on this quickly i was expecting them to wait until the major to realize that alliance don't have complete flexibility right so like alliance have been kind of soaring high very quickly because they've been training very hard um like any tournament they can get their hands on they're involved in on top of that they were kind of a little bit ahead of the curve when they kept caught into things like phoenix and korean uh with the resurgence of earth spirit they basically been one step ahead of other teams suddenly these teams catch up that advantage isn't there anymore so you ain't a shame we didn't get another patch drop so alliance could maybe try and wiggle a advantage but like despite everything that's occurred there the one thing i do want to give them credit to uh is boxy because boxy if you talked to me two months ago, Boxy was the easiest way to guarantee a win against the Lions. Not because he's a bad player, but because his hero pool is very predictable and very easy to close down. Now, he's only kind of added like two, three primarily in there at the moment that we've seen compared to like the regulars of things we saw for a long time like Beastmaster and Brewmaster. But it's at least enough that it's very hard for a team to just cancel him out completely. And yeah. I think that's like big because he's proven he's a very capable player. Congratulations to him on getting, you know, top one on the leaderboards. But, you know, uh, Liz said he could do it. So I reckon I could do it as well. Anyone could do it, really. <laughs> Enough I, time. Uh, I think I put um, Boxy as, one of, as my MVP for one of the days as well. Like, like that guy was performing. He's fantastic. No, he, he has got a lot of real talent. Um, Mike, everyone's like always talking about Mike, right? It's like, in fairness, how does Boxy even stand out when you see all these amazing plays at the time. For me, like, Mike was very uh, underwhelming, which is kind of shocking, because he, he's, like, everyone's, you know, you know the smell on Nisha's panties right now going, oh, yeah, this guy, this is, the, this is this year's ace, this is the new guy. Like, well, Mike was being viewed the same way a few months back. Like, everyone wasn't just after Nisha, they were after Mike as well. Um, Alliance had to work very hard to keep their hands on him. Yeah, yeah. Could have, could have ended up winning TI. Okay, maybe. Who knows what what the uh, future could have held for him? OG, right? Um, we do have another topic, but first, a quick question from the old Twitch chat, of course. So, if you do have any questions, throw them down in the chat. How do you rate VP in this tournament, and how do you see them doing in the next tournament and Liquid as well? And the rumored drama. I don't know what the rumored drama is, but uh, we'll stick with the first question. Uh, VP coming into the uh, major. What are we expecting? Do you want to go first, uh, Ben, or do you want me to take it? Yeah, and you know what? You you go first. I'll right. retort off you. All yeah. right, because you know I'm, I'm EU CIS. <laughs> He'll be here, you know? retorting. I've been, I've been stuck with a Bosnian that speaks Russian and English, so I'm kind of <laughs> kind of well versed. 
So VP are this team that for a long time teams just looked at and gone, I don't know how to deal with them. I don't know how to deal with them. And recently teams have started to realize that you can actually match their pace. You can actually take them blow for blow. Secret especially are showing that. I think VP are at the beginning of a decline because they're going to go through a stage where what has worked has worked for so long they don't adapt and teams are going to start to realize what they've been doing. They're going to change the way they approach Doha, which is this pace, right? Because VP, I mean, there's a reason I call Team Spirit uh, mini VP. And it's literally, if you ask me what makes Spirit a good team, it's, this, it's the speed at which they play Doha. The whole logic is we throw so much crap at you, you can't process what's happening. And VP do that more elegantly. So as teams have begun to dissect this, you know, we, we saw it with Secret. Like, they stomped VP. Same with Vici, right? Like, it was 2-1. Uh, but still, they stomped them. Yeah. And it's because teams have actually had enough time. And kind of, you know, they didn't need to worry about the TI too much because there's always that handicap for, for VP. So even if their analysis didn't come back on point, they were good to go. But, like, I think for them... Yeah, it's going to be a decline. They're not going to... I don't think they're going to actually win as much. It's not that they're not capable. It's that when you have so long where a play style works, you're going to have a stagnation period when people count on you, right? Like, it's yeah. that type of person... I'm following your wins. logic. Like, you, you win 500 games in a row as Ember Spirit. Then you lose, like, 2,000. You're just stubbornly in denial. Uh, they won't do it to that extreme, but you get the idea. It's kind of a pattern. Picking up what as... you're putting down. Okay. Yeah. The, the thing which really surprised me was, um, you know... If I ever see VP and they pick up a brood in a good brood game, then I'm always like, all right, I usually turn off the stream, honestly. Honestly, like, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm not watching that, you know? I wouldn't watch, a, like, a full-grown man uh, fight a toddler in a ring just to watch the toddler <laughs> get, like, you know, punched out. That's not what I'm into. So usually I turn off the stream. But this one time I was like, ah, you know what, like... I'll, I'll watch the first five minutes, you know, watch like Ramsey's destroy this PL, like PL versus Brood, and then Ramsey's just sitting on the tower taking 11 hits off the tower, and I'm like, excuse me, what's going on here? What is wrong with you, VP? So I do feel like they were not playing the way VP usually play in this tournament, like literally 11 hits from that. There, there were issues beyond what were, I don't, I don't know what was happening, that like big choke or whatever, but... I do think we're going to see a better VP in the future. I still think they will do well in the major, but yeah, like, again, I don't I don't totally agree with you, what you're saying, but I don't totally disagree either. Um, you know, I, I do think that VP just basically need to find a new way to smash people into the ground, but once they do, you know, they're, they're much more inventive than I think you're giving them credit for. I think they'll find new ways to keep doing what they're doing and keep up that aggression and tempo. Um, but... What about Liquid, uh, uh, Ben? I'll, I'll leave this one to you. What about Liquid, the guys who didn't make it to Amber? I'm interested to see what's going on. I, I think the rumor is that they haven't re-signed their contracts with Liquid yet, the players. So things are kind of all out of whack. I think that's the rumor that I saw on Twitter, but Twitter okay. is one of those areas where I just, you know, I don't believe half the things that are on. The Twilight Zone. Yeah, people tweet at me, you're a great caster. I don't believe it. I stop <laughs> believing a lot of things no um <clears throat> but yeah i think that's the rumor we haven't really seen this team this season uh too much except for qualifiers so we've seen them lose just, yeah we've seen them lose and and I, it's a small almost a, a too small of a sample size to really tell what's happening so i i just i'm excited to see liquid we'll see where it goes but i think a lot is up in the air as for virtus pro i don't think it's as much that they're not performing as well as much as the talent on all the other teams. It's just, it's gone up a notch. Like it, every team at ESL for the most part had a chance at winning, I think. And when was the last time you had a tournament where it was like, you know, a lot of these teams are this, are, are this top tier. You know, there's usually three, four yeah. or five teams at a tournament where you're just like, Mm, they're probably not going to win. Maybe they'll get out of groups. They'll upset, at, at, you know, in the first round of, of the the playoff round. But I think just everybody's getting better. The depth in terms of what teams are good is getting a lot better. And it's not v Virtus Pro so much not performing as well as much as it's everybody else is performing that much better. I think. All right. So the playing ground is is leveled, um, yes. which is why we're not seeing VP.
and uh, definitely Liquid not perform up to scratch. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say I heard that uh, rumor about Liquid not um, signing their contracts yet or anything, but I don't know. Who, who, who knows what's true and what's false? Uh, as you say, best just to... All speculation. It's hard to really I... comment on that either. It's like, oh, well, so what if they don't sign with Liquid again? Then, you know, not like they're not going to find another organization. Uh, I don't think this team will split up either because... I'll sign them. They're buddies. Yeah. <laughs> team B cop, let's go. Little did everybody know, I won the Mega Millions, one point six billion dollars, and uh, I'll sign him. Yeah. No, no, no. Don't you have that uh, coffee guys which you sign with or something? I didn't sign with them. They just sent me stuff. They sent you stuff. Like Madrinas, yeah. Let's go. Madrinas Dota two team. I had to yeah, signing oh, new liquid. Always with energy. That would be Madrinas. If you guys are listening, let's put it together. We got. <laughs> yeah. this. We're good. You come to team manager. Easy peasy. Uh, okay, let's move on. Um, so next thing I want to talk about, uh, we talked about the group stage knockouts. Let's talk about the main stage knockouts. Um, the first two I want to talk about is uh, Forward and uh, EG, a group those two together, because of course both of them were playing without their... Well, I think EG should have suffered more from this because they were playing without Samael, and EG is a team created around Samael, and he wasn't there. So I'm actually impressed that they performed as well as they did. And I am looking like I'm looking on at the major thinking like this this is this is EG's major. That's what I'm thinking right now. I definitely think EG are gonna come into this major with anger. They Anger. Like, oh jeez. Anger. Christ. I feel like they weren't happy that they didn't have Sumail at ESL. Like how far in advance are you looking at a tournament where it's like it's gonna be all five of us, it's gonna be amazing, like we're gonna we're gonna steamroll. Yeah. But, and now they're coming into KL Major seeing that it's like Sumail is the heart of this team and we need him. So we're <laughs> going to show that we're going to perform this well and and we're angry. We're angry we didn't have him in uh, Germany and now we're going to have him in Malaysia and I think they're going to start to really roll. I'd like, I would like to see where the groups are set or when the groups are set. Yeah. Uh, well, that won't come some time. Yeah, DreamHack probably. Probably a dream league will probably have to go through then, but yeah. So you're suggesting that um, Evil Genius is going to take out their frustration at German bureaucracy on the other teams, <laughs> which is a pretty good way to channel your anger. Um, Pigeon, what about forward gaming? Because I think it's a lesser extent with them because your WAV is not such a vital point. They're more of a team which works around resolution. But still, I, how did Excalibur perform in your eyes? Um, on it. Sorry, Excalibur. Like, like, okay, so we had kind of had this discussion. Of like, Excalibur is a guy that will get on the ranking board and get you up to number one. But there has to be a question mark as to why you don't see him on any teams, right? Like, there's got to mm -hmm. be something going on here. And I can only imagine it's got something to do with his integration into teams, maybe. Right. Like, I, I can't speculate too much, but it's like, they, they seems very slender. They didn't seem very on board. The ideas on how to play the game seem to be very split between the group. And it was kind of weird to watch. I think actually, like everyone talks about how much EG were hurt by not having Sumail. I'd say it's the same actually for Ford. Like, come on. Yoa is an incredible player. Like, he, you know, other than the relationship, like, blood relation, there's a reason that people kind of do look at him as the mini Sumail, the upcoming guy, right? Like, he is a very talented mid. And I think, like, that was the biggest shock for me is, is how easily Ford Gaming were falling and how low. Like kind of lackluster they were. I think if any team's going to be mad, like EG to some extent will kind of be happy with what they've done. They'll be mad they didn't get their man in because of visa problems, but they'll be kind of happy with their performance with a standard. You know? But for Ford, you got to be looking and going, I'm not happy at all. We should have done better even with a stand in than this. Because it, like, no offense to Pain, but you didn't take a single damn game from them and it didn't look close either. Um, yeah. From the games, like me and Liz, we, we kind of like analyzed one or two of them. We're just sitting there looking at item choices. Like every step, Ford were playing in a way that suggested they didn't want to win the game. If that makes sense. Like they were so defensive, they couldn't win a game. Uh, it was kind of odd to watch. This, you got to keep in mind, this is, you know, minus one individual or two in this case because of stand ins, a team that got top eight at TI. Didn't feel like it. Really yeah. did not feel like it. And the talent on that team as well, you know, even without Yawa, you've still got, you know, Aoi as the coach, you've got Universe in that team as well. There's some serious minds going into this team. So, yeah, I mean, they, yeah. they didn't they didn't do awfully in this tournament, but they definitely didn't do as well as they should. And as you say, two games going down to Pain, and then Pain just looked horrible versus, uh, was it Secret they came up against next? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so. They, Wait, no, no, no. They went no, against no, no. Aster and beat Aster 2-1, to one, which was a little bit of a surprise to me to see Aster just get dropped in consecutive series out of the tournament. Yeah. But then it was a uh, secret that beat him in under an hour total. Yep. Yeah. Okay. They were quick. One of the things that I w was interested for forward gaming was uh, why don't you move like Rezo back to mid and throw Owie in there? Get him into the one spot. You know, keep it, <laughs> keep it in house and do yeah. something like that. I mean, I guess just because Aoi's new to this uh, coach position, they wanted to have at least one e tournament's experience with him as a coach before they approach the Kuala Lumpur Major. So I can understand the decision from that perspective. But uh, yeah, I'm kind of with you on that one. And they even managed to get Excalibur's Tinker as well, and he still just felt very underwhelming. I think they also did a try to do a Drow Strat as well, um, which they lost. I think like, the two games they had a Tinker, and then they had a Drow with... I can't remember what they put Excalibur on. A uh, TA. That was it. Drow TA. And it just didn't work at all because I think Excalibur just couldn't deal with the pressure of being the win condition here. And I, I found that so strange. I don't think you can run a Drow Strat when you're running with a stand-in in your middle lane because then your carry is not going to be the win condition. And you basically, you know, when you run a Drow, Drow Strat, you basically say, all right, we're, we're kind of sacking one of our lanes. You know, we know we're not going to do fantastic in that lane and we're going to be have a little bit of an underwhelming carry, but our mid laner and our off laner are going to be doing like crazy crazy things and you know i think i think that's just far too much pressure to put on someone especially like excalibur who hasn't had much tournament experience um so the last team i want to talk about who got knocked out as you did mention them uh, aster who uh you know my favorite team coming into it they looked so good in that group stages like those games i was like damn like this 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 team are gonna take it all you know they they finished top of their group b they were they were looking fantastic and then they get to the main stage and it just all falls apart you know starting in the groups and did they win anything? They uh, did not. They got 2-1 no. by VG, and then they got 2-1 by Pain Gaming. And that Pain Gaming was, uh, you know, the two games they lost to Pain Gaming were a smack. It, it was yeah. 23 minutes and 24 well, minutes. That's just like, whoa. Did they win the first game? Yeah, they won the first game in an yeah. hour. So that's an yeah. hour long game. Yeah. I think that's a big part of what happened there, right? Like a momen very momentum based coming into this, especially as a new team. I think new teams, especially, they're yet to build the emotional fortification. No, I'm dropping the big words out. I um, that's the same <laughs> but... word right there, fortification. You'd be doing well in the English uh, American university. Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, I did. I did go to university, so it, it did leave me with the big words, which I treasure greatly. <laughs> but yeah, emot emotional fortification, which is something which takes teams a long time to build up, I think. And I think I think Asta might just need to kind of get their get their heads out of the game a little bit and go have the ability to reset because once you get into that slump once you get because they weren't playing well in those games in any of the main stage games they played, I would say. Even in the ones they won, it took way longer than it should have. So I just think that Aster still have a lot to do. I still think they've got so much talent and so much like ability and creativity to be able to pull off some good wins, some good positionings, but not if they keep letting things get into their head. You know, you can't rely on momentum. You can't rely on momentum. That's like the biggest lesson they should take home from this. Yeah, uh, Aster to me, it, it, one, it was a surprise they went 9-1 in the group, mm -hmm. and then it yeah. was a surprise they got knocked out the way they did. Um, the last time I was, or I joined you and Mo, we talked about how Aster, this is their first global, uh, LAN. So, you know, we're watching them finally have global opponents, not just being up against the Chinese region. And they performed really well in groups, and then it almost felt like they were a little bit predictable in the main stage, but it also could have been nerves. This is the first time this team is performed on a main stage together i mean i know a lot of these guys have experience on their team the only one i would say who doesn't really have experience is Disa, and uh, he was one of the guys who i think underperformed in the main stage uh quite heavily compared to the group so i think it comes with more experience a tournament like this that's not dpc points is important for learning you know even even secret who won learned something from esl uh, there's always a lot to be taken out from these third party tournaments and especially coming into Aster who qualified for the KO major and are going to be seeing a lot of these teams again. There's a lot to take in. I think that is uh, very important for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, All right. 
Go ahead, say that, like that's kind of the, the interesting thing is actually when you look at this squad, it it is a pretty experienced squad individually, right? It's like you uh you do think yeah. there'd be a lot more kind of uh what's the word for? Well, we use emotional fortification, right? Morale boosting, right? Is um from Femrit in game. You you gotta keep in mind this is a man who's been to multiple TIs. He knows what he's talking about. You could kind of imagine him leading this squad. Uh, the interesting one for me would be how, what kind of substance burning gave, right? Like definitely in the draft, I can imagine. But this is new territory for him as well. I think this is the first time he's coached a team, or is it the second time? It he hasn't be been the doing second because it's a big question I've ever I heard it. Coach... Yeah, didn't he coach IG for a little bit? I think he did, but it was a short period, right? Like, yeah. So so he's relatively new to this. Like, um, to compare it to the Aoi scenario, our Aoi's been at this since. May. I think he started with the Birmingham Major. So he's got some months experience. And you can kind of imagine how like he's adapted. So he's had time. I'm giving I'm Burning a little bit more excuse than my boy Ali. I feel bad for that. But it's kind of interesting. It's like I think more than anything, I'd focus on where was their ability to reset or think differently. Because in best of ones, you can kind of get anything by anyone, right? Anyone can take a best of one is the argument because you don't know what's going to go down. And if it's a team you aren't familiar with. They might just throw a blindside on you. But when you go in best of threes, the fact that they lost 2-1-2-1 kind of resonates, I think. It says a lot that this team maybe do need to try and like flex a little bit more, think outside the box, and not be as predictable. Because I think that was the biggest issue, is that while they did play good Doha, very quickly, if you just sat down as a team and watched the recordings, you could tell what you needed to do to beat them. Do you think that... Um best of twos are more like a two best of ones whereas a best of three is more momentum based so i feel like they kind of perform better in groups because of maybe that where it's two different like i don't know I, it's a weird theory yeah it's it's kind of weird right because the argument is that in a best of two a team can look at it two different ways if they get one victory they've secured a draw at least they're not going to lose or they get a resounding victory, whereas a best of three, it's all in, you win or lose, right? So it's like, yeah. I think it depends on the team and the mentality, but logically, at this day and age, when you're playing this level in Doha, your approach should never be, we've at least got a draw. It should always be, I want victory, right? Like, you need to have a mindset that can dissect and, and, and basically split apart the ideas of what I need to do to come back if this fails, but like that's in the back of your mind, right? That's there in case you start to up the front four always has to be this is what we do to win this is the move we make right so it's, it's kind of weird in that regard it's like the moment you start down yourself you notice it straight away and i think fans can notice it on a team as well we've seen plenty of examples in big tournaments where a team just randomly does something stupid and dies i, I think like that whole vici gaming in the pit scenario was a perfect example of doing something stupid and dies yeah, like, that was a that. Well, I think they had to go for that play. Everything after felt shaky. That well, they was didn't. The most, they didn't um, fully commit. I don't think that it was very weird. It's like actually, most teams I've talked to a bunch of captains about this. Like the kind of they're so disciplined these days that almost across the board, the argument is it's not even an argument. A statement is made. If there's an interruption when you're roaching, you deal with the interruption. You do not finish the game because there have been countless examples of how that goes badly. There have been fragmented examples of where that grows great for you, right? It's like, those are the memorable ones. So to like a spectator or a fan, like you or me watching Dota, those are the ones we remember, right? Those big plays where it's like, damn, right at the end, they finished the roast just in time, they turn it around. But for like a player, there's just hundreds of examples where they decide to ignore their opponents, finish the roast. Even if they pick up the Aegis, they die after they get it. It's, it's very interesting. Too risky, too risky. Yeah, it's, uh, but... Yeah, I mean, back to your initial question, I've never really thought about it, but like the evidence is that there's in best of twos, there is a lot of draws coming out, like a lot of draws when the, I think there are more draws than there were, you know, three game series in, in best of three matches. So that's definitely something there. Like you, you might yeah, be right. Maybe, 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 all draws. maybe right. it does encourage complacency. I, I, I don't know. I think well, it's maybe I'm... more experimentation, right? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. You like, have that. Oh, we got win. You're not going to get eliminated right there. Maybe the last couple of days, I think, are if you're in a spot where you might get eliminated, you kind of push a little bit more. But I feel like group stage, you have that feeling of, well, today I can't get eliminated. So why yeah. don't I try? 
why don't I, you know, and I don't know how much that whole saving strats comes into play either. I'm not a huge believer in that. Yeah, I, I, I think it's definitely part of it. And I could actually say, like, I can see Alliance kind of going throughout that group state, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, we drew again. It's fine, you know, we, we, we got another draw. It's cool, you know. Or every time they win, going like, you know, oh, yeah, we'll just play next game, kind of uh, try something new. Or, oh, we won't show this strat yet because, you know, we've won one game and then they end up losing. They're like, oh, it's fine. It's just a draw. That complacency, I think, did come into play in those in those group stages. And I think, um, yeah, it may have led to the downfall of draws. some teams. Yeah, I definitely felt that way. EG went all draws. Like, that's where they were at, I feel like. Yeah. 1-1 one, one to everybody. <laughs> it's 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 an achievement. It's it's a weird achievement, but it's an achievement all the same. All right. It seems to set yourself achievable goals. Come on. Like, yeah. <laughs> we're not going to win, but we're not going to lose. So winning no. them all isn't feasible. Winning half of them seems that sounds reasonable. Come on. Yeah, when you're ahead, you guys, guys, let's calm down. You know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna one one this one. Whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> we don't, we don't want to get a two zero. Fifty percent here, guys. We're not gonna overdo it, are we? Okay, let's let's just take, let's let them have a free racks, handicaps, handicaps. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. I'm sure of it. Um, okay, let's let's move on to the final two teams. Obviously, we didn't watch them play. Secret and Avicii, and I want to know what changed since Ti, because Avicii had a terrible time at Ti, and. Uh, Secret, they they did all right. They did okay, but nothing like what we saw today. So um, obviously, secret. Um, you know, you had the big change up. Um, yeah. you had uh, Nisha coming in. Here's a really interesting one. Um, yeah, talk talk to me about Nisha. Uh, I'll give this one to Ben. Ha yeah, Ben. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, switch I, it I up. I think Nisha is almost a, a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. Like. We see with Secret, they bring in someone like Ace, and then they bring in someone like Nisha. It's kind of a similar story where it's this guy who's worked really hard, has shown a lot of promise, and now comes into a team with mid one Zai, Yapsor, and Puppy. Like th this kid is already performing at a top tier level. There's more for him to learn. He's, you guys said, now he's 18 years old. I mean, he's so young, and, and I think he's got that that young and looking for blood mentality right now where he just wants to prove that he deserves to be on team secret probably one of the biggest org names in all of dota at the moment and that's a big change for secret like they've got a kid who wants to give it an infinity percent and in every game and he's got so much to learn from the rest of his team that i could see secret not only did they just win this but we could see Secret be almost equivalent to what Virtus Pro were last year with a kid like Nisha. I feel like Five. with um, when you look at Ace, especially in this kind of scenario, is he's kind of on a road to rediscovery. Is <laughs> he he started off, you know, suddenly this this prodigy has been revealed by Puppy. You now it can kind of go to you when you come from like nowhere and you get that big break at, at somewhere like Team Secret. It's not complacency per se. It's just there's a stage at which you feel like you are the best. So you can kind of let it go to your head, I guess you could say. And of course, Nisha, he's got a lot to prove. He's off to a good start. The catch is going to be once he reaches that curve point, can he convince himself that, well, I'm, I like to believe I'm the best, but I got to stay ahead of the game, right? Like, is that kind of logic is there's always someone that's going to be better than you, right? And if you let up for a second, they will take the title from you. They will take your number one spot. They will just crush you, spirit, body, everything. Just throw you in the dumpster and say, what up, Ace? Look at me, 18 years old. Puppy loves me now. Daddy got nothing left for Ace. See you later. Hope you like Mr. Saltmaster in the EU, because that's all you're getting. I'm just imagining now, like, Ace on a soul-searching journey, you know, in the autumn winds, you know, walking, over, walking by the seaside, sitting down by a lake and looking at his reflection in the mirror as a lift, as a leaf. Gently and then drops the down waves, and smears his reflection, yeah. As the waves come in, they start to form out of salt into something. <laughs> Peter. He's <laughs> arrived on the, on, on the, we'll say the Norwegian. Sorry, not Norwegian. Uh, it's Danish. Danish. The yeah. Danish shores. Yeah. Right? In Europe. Ready to show. He's like, yeah. <laughs> I have a dream. That dream 
is Nips. Yeah, he, he's just he's just sitting on the coastline looking down, and then the salt starts to congeal. What is that? The salt just starts to build up the sea salt. <laughs> Like PPD, like wow, I've traveled all the way through the salts of the ocean to join you in Denmark. There's a blowing on the wind. <laughs> Eater! No, no, I'm not going back there. I'm happy now. Yeah, fingernails <laughs> on the sand, being dragged through. I think that's Zai's motivation as well. And I was saying to you guys when he's get like landing these big RPs, like wow, Zai's playing too well. Like yeah, he doesn't want to go back to Optic. Jesus. <laughs> Come on, like Pycat is just standing there waiting for his bros to return. I, th you know, what? that is the. Everyone talks about how everyone's found these new teams. I feel bad for Pycat because I genuinely think, in my opinion, he was the most consistent person on the side of Ops. Right? Everyone talks about 33 and they want to sniff his panties. He's amazing. Yada, I yada, want to sniff 33's panties. I'm sure you do. Right? But it's like when you set up someone to be your star player, it's very easy for it to be that way. Right? Like, um, you know, when people look at Liquid, no one's been set up to be the freaking star player. They're all star players. Whereas you looked at Optic, and it's like everything was about 33, the way they draft, the way they fought. It's like, you know, give some love to Pike. I, I, I think they started off as, as being a very, like, uh, Zai focused team. Then things started to move on, the meta started to develop, because obviously when they set up, like, it, it was the four, which was, uh, you know, everybody was, uh, was on, on board the Zymobile. But then when things started to move on a little bit, yeah, like you, you couldn't rely on your four so much. And then I think it, there was a phase where they were drafting around Pycat. They were trying to get him his Luna and trying to get him his uh, Terrorblade and his uh, uh, Phantom Lancer. And he didn't perform in that stage. And it's then that they realized they had like, you know, where they were sitting on this golden goose of uh, Netta, uh, 33. But yeah, he, he couldn't quite do enough. And who, who's he Who's he with now? Is he, he's with he's no on one. Uh, he's is he with on no one at all. He's with no one at all. Like, as in he he's is... Right. Complete freelance, and that's He's kind of my gone. point. Is like, like he didn't need to be this that full focus. Me. Like that, yeah, that's what I mean. Like he, he's the Matumba man. He doesn't need to be the focus of the draft. He doesn't need to be the focus of the team. But he will still perform. He will still deliver. He will still win you games. And that's why I'm shocked. Like I, I'm shocked because I think honestly, I think he would have been one of the quickest pickups because you take someone like 33, you have to build a team around, him, right? You take someone like Pycat, you just slot him in. Slot him in any way you want, right? Okay. The cookie cutter pick. Kind of surprised in that regards. But then again, you know, like, uh, so what else do we have? Zai walked off secret. You have PPD go form Nip, which, by the way, everyone can say what they want about anyone on that team. Saxa is a freaking god. That man has proven himself the star player of Nip so far, uh, which has shocked a lot of people. I'd say, like, actually, out of all the wind ranges I've seen this year, he's the most phenomenal one. Like, well, or, or you support. can almost say that this is his resurgence after his soul searching. If we're going to go down the storyline of soul searching, deep root. <laughs> yeah, I mean, last me year, last year he seemed kind of lost. You know, he was a stand in for Optic for a little bit, played for Team World, Echo International, and like all these different teams. Complexity. Yeah, uh, for a little center. bit as a stand in. Like, this guy was going from team to team to team searching and then all of a sudden he's like turning his head he sees 33 and everybody just kind of soul searching in the salt mines and they all get brought together here to play for ninjas in pajamas and and he's not gonna let this this opportunity go too quickly that's for sure i think a lot of these guys who are seeing succeed or hungry prove uh that they need to be here that they're a top tier one player all right I think yeah. socks the right route I got a new business idea. I think I'm gonna start, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, nomad soul searching. So like any player who's like, you know, uh, not picked up and is, is, is looking for a new team, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like, yeah, you know, come pay me, you, you can come with me. We'll, uh, you know, you pay me like a, a daily fee and we'll, we'll, we'll find your soul for you. You know, we'll go to like the Tibetan mountains, you know, climb, climb a, th a thousand steps wearing, I don't know, like coals in our shoes or something and go talk to the monks. Spend lots and lots of nights by the by the seashore, away from people, and listening. Would would we'll listen to the winds? I'll teach him how to listen to the winds, and you know, I'll make sure each and every player can can find their souls as quickly as possible. No man soul searching. No, no. See, I I I'm I'm already picturing this. It's gonna say no man soul searching, and then like the wind's gonna blow it down. It's literally just gonna say catfishing. This is yeah. what I'm getting from this right <laughs> now. This is. Like this is full on shaky dating services. Yeah, not, I just want, I just want to, I just want a cutie well, esports. His name BF. is Nomad. Like that is yeah. perfect for soul searching. Good point. And I, I'm I didn't thinking more. That. You're you're walking on the planet. What was it? Uh, Last Jedi. 
where they're on the planet <laughs> yeah. that's just covered in salt. The guy goes down, he's like, salt. It's like, that's the planet you're on right now. That's where you're, you're yeah, taking your stick and to. just walking around, making sure you can find the next team. Yeah, I, I, I'm well up for that, you know, being like the Yoda on their backs. That's my dream. Anyway. My dream is to <laughs> piggyback on PP, right? I want to ride Peter, guys. That's what I live not PP, and not dream PPD. for. He doesn't need to oh, spend sorry. any souls. I want to ride Saxa. Okay? Yeah, yeah, Saxa or thirty-three, whoever needs it. Yeah. Pie Cat, he better let me ride him Pay too. Me to I'm ride gonna you. ride them all. I'm gonna ride my way through the Dota sea. Absolutely, That's how I'll make it. It's a nomad dream. Um, all right then. So, <laughs> who were your standouts? Uh, firstly, let's go for heroes. I want to know which hero stood out for you as a hero which you went. Oh yeah, that guy's pretty good actually. Uh, pigeon go. Ooh. Oh, did I really see any that surprised me? No, I guess Brewmaster, just because you know, like it's always nice to just see people refresh the support role and say something else can work, and <laughs> remind everyone that this guy has one of the most powerful, brutal. I use the word power already. Power spikes <laughs> at level six. Like Brewmaster is probably top three for that. Like power spikes are six alongside like say visage and what else am i thinking those are definitely the two top ones but it's like yeah. you know people forget this like visage has moved away from the support towards a core well why can't brew go the other way you know and uh puppy lord poopan has proven that to us you know it's i like that he like always said, did. Like you... i'm always this person that will love anyone that will walk up to me and go have you ever thought playing this cause of support Yes, let's have a conversation right now. I've got a few ideas of my own. You know? It's always refreshing. It, it reminds you that Dota is not a, a, like a linear game. Anything can work. Exactly. The no-tail logic in life, right? Mm -hmm. What we're looking for. Alrighty. Uh, ben, what about you? What's your, what's your standout hero of the tournament? I mean, standout... I, I don't know. There's so many heroes that just like have been in the mixer for a while. I think one kind of making a a bigger swing into things is Centaur. I would say a little bit. Yeah. I don't know. There's so it's just like how many how many times have we seen all these heroes? Like Terraboy gets picked every single game. And 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 Lena gets picked and Tiny gets picked. Earthshaker, Weaver, like maybe the standout. Man. I, I almost have to agree with Brew just because he's so, you know, you can play him three, four, five if you really want to. Okay. but i just i don't know i feel like nobody really stands out when a a patch has been like this for so long if that makes sense like we we yeah. know who's who's gonna be there we know that phoenix is gonna be important we know that we're gonna see necro be important treant's gonna be there terrorblade's gonna show up in uh well, every big, game if you really want him to the big surprises for me like i've got like two of them is enigma early on not throughout the later stage of the tournament but early on and even towards the start of the main stage as well enigma had a crazy high win rate and he was being picked up a lot and played like really really well so um enigma is definitely a big surprise for me the other one um invoker because it's been a long time since we've seen invokers being picked up anything other than that that surprise 10th pick and we've seen some third and fourth phase invokers coming out which is not what i expected but it's 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 cool to see that hero coming back a little bit. I mean, the Enigma should be expected. You have to keep in mind that in the current context of the game, XP denial is the game, right? It's basically, there's so much you can get since those changes they made to a denying in terms of XPs. Mm -hmm. That for a hero like Enigma, it's just a dead giveaway. Like, you want to pick this hero. First started uh, at the beginning of September with Lich. People start picking Lich. Why are they picking Lich? Oh. Huh. I'm leveling a lot slower now. What's going on? Damn, I'm gonna have to change the way I play this lane. Suddenly Enigma comes out of nowhere. It's like every wave, baby. Every wave. That range creep is gone. He's mine. All right. My children will just emerge from its chest as it screams as I murder my own ally and create some new ones. And then I come for your head. And it's just on top of that, not only does this hero starve you in the lane, he's the ultimate insurance policy, right? Like, I love to talk about insurance policies. You talk about Sansa, you talk about Phoenix, these big fat ultimates that make you think twice about committing to a fight. And Enigma is just top of the list. He always has been for his ultimate, right? But it's not like, in people's mind, it's not like, oh god, he's gonna get a five-man black hole. No, we're not that stupid. But if he just black holes Terrorblade, no one is picking BKB piercing abilities. 
Well, science is pretty pretty damn meta. Bane yeah, is but that's that's it. But right now. The thing the thing is like Bane is reactionary to that, right? He's coming back in that regard. Uh, there are means to kind of counter it. It's the Sansa example Bane though, the like the Sansa is a very kind of awkward hero in the like once again, it's insurance policy. It's kinda of like mutually assured destruction, right? I'm not gonna commit my care commit mine. You don't commit yours. So if you commit yours, I'm gonna blow the hell up of everyone else, right? Because that's the logic. If you commit global, he black holes. So you don't ever glo uh, global because he's got black holes. Um the difference there is Enigma can be present in the fight and still be useful. You get past like the 20, 25 minute mark with a silencer. He's sitting in the base. He's like, guys, I'll help you out the best I can, but if I show up, I'm dead. And he knows it, right? Yeah. We've seen some Sansa get absolutely ruined this tournament. It's been pretty yes. funny to watch. It's like, when you see a Sansa, you, and there's some games you're just like, wow, you, they've literally just picked you that for the ultimate. Like, the, the support player just goes, oh, for God's sake, I'm just going to be like, I'm literally just an R. Uh. Like, you, you always, like, you could imagine the support being like, yes, we lost the lane. Why are you happy? That means there's going to be a lane pushing in, so I'm going to get XP when you guys are out doing things on the map. I'll watch this lane, guys. I'm a silencer. <laughs> feels that way. Very much feels that way sometimes. All right, some questions from Twitch. Uh, what do you guys think about carries being picked first? I feel that it shows two things. One, not enough strong heroes in the pool to pick from, and two, not enough strong supports to counter those picks. Well, to me, I'm just going to jump on that one quickly, is that... It felt that way in the grand finals because both Secret and Vici are both of these teams which like to play this kind of uh, linear Dota, if you like. Um, well, actually, no, that's not fair to Secret, but Vici for sure, they're picking this these Terror Blades and these kind of uh, Phantom Lance and such quite early on because they just want to know what they're building their hero around. They know what they're going to do. The enemy knows what they're going to do, so there's not really much point trying to hide it. You might as well um, save those counter picks for later on. Uh, Secret, on the other hand, I think they've been picking the Terror Blades and the PLs quite early because these are these niches heroes, and you want, especially with someone who's relatively new to a team, you don't want to be experimenting with different picks just yet. You just want to make sure that your core team is playing as best they possibly can, and uh, that absolutely worked for Secret. So I think that was the, in, indeed the right call. Uh, what about you guys? Anything to say on the matter? It's I... like, in the... oh, do you want no, do you want to go back? <laughs> no, I, I, it's up to you. <laughs> I, I was gonna say like it, it's basically it's just an evolution of the drafting map it's like mm -hmm. you have to keep in mind for a long time those different point in the draft at which you try and take a lead right for a long time it's been the third pick the third pick is the roller where one team takes an advantage and forces the other to react what this is more than anything is it's teams basically trying to very early in the draft go to their opponents you now have to respond to me you have to adapt to what I'm picking and it's a trap that is hard to avoid, especially when you think it's a, if you think it's a core being picked, you have to respond to it. And that leaves you in an awkward conundrum, especially when we talked about this flexibility of roles right now. Because if I pick a, you know, let's say I pick a Lena first phase, you have to, do, you have to fight the instinct to believe that that is a core straight away. And remember that it might not be. Same with Tiny, same with Weaver. Like any of these guys, the moment you think that they're a core and like you're 100% committed to that, you lose the draft because the moment it's revealed it's not, you don't know what to do anymore with that final pick or last two picks, right? So it's basically what it is at the end of the day is it's all about draft advantage by forcing your opponent to react to your move. Then you're always one step ahead. It's very hard to get out of that. There are some moves that work like picking up a Broodmother or a Husker, but it's very rare. Ben, what did you want to say? We see a lot of carries get picked up early, and I think what the trend is right now is picking your mid last almost. Uh, we see a lot of Lena's picked last, Invoker picked last. Uh, it seems like we saw Tiny get picked last for VG. Granted, I, I didn't agree with that pick. So much more to go with. But uh, I, I think it's also a little bit of confidence. These teams are confident in their core. Confident in in those first two picks, where you see what support. It, I, I I don't have any stats to prove this. I'm not Nahaz, but uh, it's almost like the first two picks are who's going to be laning together. We'll see like the core and who he's laning with as like your first two picks. Otherwise, it's like your support. We'll see like Phoenix Trian, but if you're going to pick your core, you usually also show who you're laning with. I think it's a lot of confidence from these teams to uh, 
pick these cores first. I don't know if I like it. It gives a lot of time to the other team to counter it, but I think it's a lot of confidence in that way. Okay, yeah, I think uh, that's a pretty good summing up of the uh, the singular core issue. Um, so now looking at um, yeah, we already talked about our uh, favorite um heroes which stood out. Uh, what about players though? Do you guys have any? Uh, not necessarily on the wing teams, just whoever. Um, but who who was your big standout players uh in this tournament? I think Yang was a big standout for me. Um, Vici obviously did really well um they tied for first i guess i don't know what the thing was that they came in second because i know they won one split with secret i don't know why they came in second for the groups i wasn't paying that close attention to that specifically but i think yang proved to be you know on a team with paparazzi and uri it's hard to stand out you know you've got one of the best carries in china and uh uri who's one of the best mids in china and it's hard to stand out. i think he did a very good job uh, especially with that Necro, he did a very good job overall in the tournament. He was, uh, you know, he. I, I think if VG won, he might have been the the MVP for. Me. Yeah, so, no, I, I, I think. think, I think yeah. Unfortunately, I can't sympathize at all. I hate the man because he's been picking Necrofoss so much. He can get in the bin as far as I'm concerned. Disgusting <laughs> Necro pickers. Uh, what about you, Pigeon? Who's your standout player of the tournament? I mean, Yang definitely comes to mind because. Like, honestly, I remember, especially that VP series, where he got the Necro, they got the Triumph Phoenix. I sat there and went, this is going to actually be an underwhelming Triumph Phoenix game. And it was. And VP should have very easily won that series, except for the variable that is Yang. That man creates so much space, whether it's an Axe or a Necro boss. And I don't say that of Necro players often. They don't create space. They just kind of absorb it. Very... Much like they absorb the fun. Way. Yes. Yes, exactly like they absorb the fun, right? It's, it's this hero that is not designed to be your big playmaker that wins you team fights it's just this arrogant sob that walks out to a lane it's like i'm just gonna i'm gonna slick a, a big freaking fly pole down here that says necro this is my lane my zone you come in it i destroy you i rip you to pieces and send you back to the fountain where you'll spend an additional amount of time there just crying and kissing your wounds but no he somehow just goes my team needs me i will go to them and just flips a freaking map in favor of his team when they were poised to lose the game. And it's like, this is not just him on a Necro. This is when he gets his axes, especially. He's definitely the best performing axe player we've seen in the last few months. Um, actually, to the point that he is turning games around for his team on his axe plays alone. Right? Before you even get to a stage where it's like, my team are now helping me kill people. We saw games where he's taking on three people at a time and Still not dying. That's incredible for an offlaner, especially. So I would say Yang is the standout. Like alongside that, maybe mid one, just because there's question marks when a player comes back after a break. Are they gonna be solid or are they gonna be very demotivated? Like you, yeah. you get two sides of it. It could go either way. So I have to give credit to mid one because I'll always like I think he is the next step in mids. Um, Yang is a phenomenal offlaner. Screw the other roles. There's only two I care about right now. Um, <laughs> you know, like fours, fives, who cares? They're all doing the same thing, right? All this flashy, you never thought this is a sport at the moment. And then who cares about a POS 1? All they do is hit creeps. Come on, guys. They pick, they, they pick Terrorblade and they hit creeps. That's like 90% of carry games right now. Unless you know where fun's at. Unless, of course, the other team picked Terrorblade, in which case you go... Damn what's it, I gotta go hit some what, heroes. What what's left, guys? <laughs> what's left? We can't pick PL because I don't want to crash my PC. Mm. And you know, you're not Kuman, so you're not gonna pick an animage and try and say that hero is relevant. <laughs> Boost is a limit. Thank God. Um, alright. So I don't actually have I I mean I asked this uh, for me, I th I still think it's Nisha, just cause you know, yes, he wasn't like the number one player on his team. He was even maybe outshadowed by Zion in the grand finals. But just for someone to come in and, you know, he was uh, previously on... Uh, King was Win? it King Win, yes. So I want to say Happy Feet. I always get Happy Feet and King Win confused. They both had Penguin logos. Well, they were logos. happy guys at one point. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And then they like Team Poland. Was, like, yeah. Whatever else. Uh, but like no, I always get uh, get Happy Feet and uh, King Wing confused just because they both had the penguin logos. I guess I'm a very visual person. We yeah, know do words King good. And, uh, 
uh, let's do it. Oh yeah, let's do it. Yeah, Happy Guys is Cinderin's team. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, anyways, sorry, yeah, um, guys, yeah, right. but yeah, it's been a long time since Let's Do It's days. Um, you know, well they were in TI quaddies, but you know, it's it's it's, it's been a while, and they did do well. And it, yeah, considering this is his first kind of real shot with a tier one team. I, th I think he did fantastically. I think he didn't crack at all under the pressure. He was, you know, he was doing what he needed to when he needed to, when he needed to be. And there, it's just so rare to to get that straight away. Um, but you could also put that down to Puppy as well, of course, being the incredible captain that he is. But you know, either way, between them both, you know, an incredible captain finding an incredible player doesn't take anything away from the incredible player. And uh, I think, yeah, Nisha did a, a really nice job. And every time they got him his Morphling as well, he was just absolutely phenomenal on that as well. So I think really good to see. And uh, yeah, and, uh, like, as I say, just great to see someone come into a team and, and be this comfortable. Very impressive to me. So, I mean, that's, that's, oh, sorry, go ahead. That's, that's kind of the thing. It's like, actually, one thing that really helped him with that was that Morphling being picked so much, the PL being picked so much. These are his heroes, right? Like, he knows them inside out. I think yeah. it's kind of an observant thing is that when you bring someone up from nowhere, know which heroes they are the best at. Because if you make them feel comfortable... OG! Uh, well, you know, like, <laughs> what, what, was it, what does it say about OG? Learn three or four heroes and win TI. Like, it, it really is that simple. You Because, you know, there's a difference. It's, between... it's, it's not quite that simple. But yeah, I get, what, well, I get what you're coming from. You know, it's that kind of argument. So if you play a hero... You know, if you play only four heroes, you play them, like, 50% better than the average pro player versus the jack of all trades team you're gonna win because there's only so much can be cancelled out in the draft and even if you'd managed to ban out most of their heroes they're still gonna pick like two of their favorable ones and be on course from there take a game because if you win two lanes you're already ahead like you know in the current meta especially it's all about winning the lanes you know don't aim to everyone i talk to always says don't aim to win three lanes aim to win two because if yeah. you're winning three lanes that's because your opponent screwed up if you're aiming to win three lanes, you screwed up. It's you know, it's it's pretty kind of reflective of that. It's like like we get to back to the original point. You bring in a new player, ask them straight away. If you for some reason don't know, because you should have been doing your research, all right. But if you don't know, you just sit there. You go, what are you good at? And if they go, I'm good at playing football. Then tell them to shut the hell up and learn Dota. But if they go, I like to play, you know, Spectre and Necrophos. Then you kick them from the team and get someone who knows how to play heroes that aren't aids. Really? Um, you know, it's basically all about enabling your players. And that's what Puppy is really good at. He's always been very, like, renowned for that. Is not just being a drafting god and a master tactician, but understanding the strengths and weaknesses of his players. Yeah, and I, I can't wait, you know. No offense to you two, but we're not exactly the uh, the, the highest standard of analysis. So I'm really excited to hear some people really get into like the nitty gritty of this, like how Puppy drafted these games in in throughout the tournament. To be honest, because uh, it was really some some interesting picks and 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 stuff coming out from him. So um, it's it's really cool to kind of just be in awe of this absolute unit of a drafter. You know um, who would have been help helpful for that, Nomad? Bowie. Yeah. Bowie would have been great Bowie? for that. Oh, yeah. I, I he does that sort <laughs> oh, well, of thing a lot. <laughs> what about Lizard as well? Yeah, he could have been great as well. Nah, he just plays yeah. two heroes at once. He doesn't really do anything else relevant anymore. He, he mainly I just don't know. Shows... Warden got picked once, so... Well, that's true, but mainly you just get him at an event so he can flex his muscles. That's about what he does these days. It's all good. I feel like you guys Savage. are hinting at something. There uh, be a fourth panel on this screen, <laughs> something of the sort. Oh, uh, <laughs> don't, don't, don't get carried <clears throat> away, Ben. We're, we're not made for fourth panels here. Three, ah. three will do. People are happy with three. The golden rule. Um, Lion's Den egg? No, Lion's Den GG. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, thought I said egg on the end, which was very odd. Uh, what did you think about team secret strategy to create two farmed four positions, Zion Yapsaw, instead of the traditional three and four? Do you think other teams will start trying to adopt this strategy? It's very specific. You re you need the right type of players to do that. It's the same logic as teams that like still run the traditional funnel everything into one guy strategies, which is bad. Or like <laughs> what we were just talking about with mid one leading the way in these kind of roaming mids again, right? Like not every team can achieve that because most teams at the moment have a mid who wants to farm. You know, and it's the same with this logic of having a four and a three. 
I like it because what you're doing is you're layering your initiation. Is most of the time when you do this with freeze and pause, it's because both of them can build a blink dagger and they can form initiation for you, right? Like whether it's an enigma plus an earth shaker, or if Sand King one day appears in the world of the living again. Uh, you know, these type of heroes do have that big impact, so you want them to get that gold. And you know someone has to give up that gold. I think the thing to kind of focus on that makes it work so well for Secret isn't just that they have this free, these three and four players that are happy to kind of integrate with each other and interchange. It's when they're giving up farm and they're kind of sharing it and then they're doing stuff with it. Think about whether they've got the right player to take advantage. Nisha is able to take advantage of that extra space. Mid one then levies more space. So it's all about multiple components. I mean, the only one mm -hmm. we haven't talked about there is Puppy, but dude, he, he made it all work. He brought it all together, okay? He got the duct tape and he got the freaking super glue and he meshed them into a giant discount mega morphin power ranger that just looks like it wants to die. But like the point is Hello. You... Sorry. Uh, just just just, just I, I wouldn't call uh, Puppy the duct tape or <laughs> the Puppy's like well, the mortar, you know. He he sets yeah. bricks down nicely and neatly. I think uh, you could probably call like Seb the uh, the super glue and duct tape because Ow. he just like no, but even no. Ti, you know, what he did worked. You know, it might have been everybody came into it thinking, what the hell is this guy just created? You know, it's like when you leave your three year old in a room on his own with some duct tape and a bunch of Lego bricks, and then he comes out with you know the brand new iPhone X X I okay. or whatever the next one's gonna be called. He's you know? either the magical party or the magical hammer, where he like just walks up to a formation or something, taps at the hammer, and it works. Yeah, exactly. That, that what's is what's he doing? Look, correct, rank eighteen on the power ranking. This guy's an idiot. Little do they know. Yeah, you got a three-year-old genius in your hands. Anyway, you know, yeah, I mean, um, he is that magical. Back to the original question, though. Um, I think two farm forbs. I, I don't think. This is something which Secret are actively trying to do in creating two four positions. I think the bigger point, uh, which is not something which Secret are the first ones to do, but it's that they don't treat farm in that numbered order. They treat farm as in, right, you know, our four position is close to his blink dagger. When he gets that blink dagger, well, that's going to let us do this, this, and this. When as our three position is close, isn't close to his, you know, um, Meteor Hammer, whatever the fuck he's going to buy. So you just go, all right, well, obviously we're going to make prioritize farm on our, our our four position a little bit more. So you, that, that gap kind of closes. And they do that for everybody as well. If their mid laner isn't that close to, you know, if the Kunker's not that close to his Daedalus, yet their four position is, is close to, you know, that, yeah, again, that blink or that force or something, then they're going to prioritize differently to the way things used to be. And I think that is just a general shift in the meta of Dota. It's what the good teams are doing. And there are some teams which don't do that, but I think they draft accordingly, so they're just kind of playing to the draft. There are exceptions to the rule, but generally I think if you're not playing this kind of uh, old school one hard carry and everybody else kind of follow along sort of uh, gameplay style, then they will just look for the next big thing and they're not going to be so strict um, to, as to kind of throw the game because you didn't want to give that, that four position his last hit to finish his bottle or whatever. I mean, it's a little bit different with Secret. Right? Like it's to the extreme. I think that's kind of the whole point that uh, I was trying to make is a lot of teams. Yes, every, every at this stage, everyone appreciates like shake up how close you are to the dagger. Okay, okay, you just go farm, whatever. Right? It's the difference is it seems the way that Secret approach their games right now between Z like Zion Yapsil is from the get go there seems to be this conception of give way. Um, but like I said, it's more than that. It's like he sure is one. Mid one's like 0.5. And then you've just got Yaps or Zaya 4 because Nisha is so greedy. And then Puppy is like, I'll be on the other side of the map trying to hit Coria. See ya. Like, that yeah. is more or less the order of things. You know, it's like there are a lot of teams where you get these super sacrificial five. It's usually for a one and a two. Um, and then the three is like an after four. It's. I think it is like secret do have a different way to like there is an argument that while teams will flex when someone gets close to a pickup, secret seems to already be thinking ten minutes in the future what they want from each of their calls or support calls. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess it, it's kind of just the initial point, but kind of on a yeah. on a larger scale. But yeah, I think we're singing from the same song sheet. Uh. We're, we're like, you know, we just got to get in sync now, right? Like yeah. highs and lows. 
Horizon list, exactly, like the waves of the sea. Uh, Alright, so uh, Ben, and any thoughts on the on a 3-4 matter? Um, I think a lot of that four positions getting farm is heavily dependent on what got picked in the draft. There are fours that are looking for a little bit more in their farm. There are fours that are just looking for level six. Um, it just it comes down to what the lineup is and, and what teams play. There are teams that like to have that three four at you know an equivalent form. I think maybe I would go as far as to say the Chinese teams like doing that because they like to have the one position have a nice open lane um they are you know trying to keep silar's lane open so they want a two three and a four that can make something happen with level six and when you're able to get those kills and 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 make all that movement you're able to get farm on your three and four and that's where they get kind of boosted up there are some teams that aren't as i don't play that similar style so i think it's really dependent on how the team plays and and how the draft really evolves with that. If you're gonna, do you want a four position who needs farm, or do you need a four position who just needs luck to make something happen? It really is different for each team. Okay, so I feel like we've uh, answered that question uh, pretty thoroughly. So you're welcome, you're welcome, Mr. Lion's Egg. Um, all right then. So coming up to our final point for today's podcast is going to be looking forward for the to the Dream League and Kuala Lumpur Major. What are you guys expecting to see now? Obviously, it's hard to uh, kind of relate for Dream League because there is only one team who is in Hamburg who is now in uh, uh, Dream League, and that is of course Complexity. But we'll just uh, run over them quickly. What are we expecting from Complexity in uh, Sweden? Uh, Pigeon, go. Spamming Shaman and winning going to Major. Like, legitimately, that is probably the strongest thing that team does right now. Is uh, no other team's doing it right now. And Zifrig is probably the best Shaman player in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, no one's really doing it so I mean, hard. He's the only Shaman anymore. player in the world. Yeah, so That's what I mean. <laughs> it's like, you know, that still counts, right? If no one else is doing it, the reason that X terrible player might be the best Techies player in the world, right? Might be a terrible player, but there's only one doing it. But no, seriously, um, it's also the fact that Complexity have two powerful drafters. Z Freak is honestly probably the craziest, most enthusiastic person I've ever talked to when you get him talking about drafts. He's just a theory crafter. He loves it, right? Now mm -hmm. imagine sticking that in a room of EE. We've already seen some things, such as Axe as a perfect example. I believe there was was it Sven as well, I think we saw come out of support. Yep. Um there's been a few others. So expect more. Lizard has already told me that he hates Envy because all he does is ruins his pub games by picking all these stupid reports right now. So <laughs> it's not letting up anytime soon, all right? It's yeah. going to keep happening. And honestly, that could easily be the deciding factor right now. Because if I look at the teams that are participating in that minor, no one's a huge stomper. So something like quirky, if you want to choose to use that word, or different drafts, could easily make all the difference okay all right um and then uh ben can you uh talk us through the kuala lumpur major who what are you expecting uh, to happen vici dominance again the cow major uh well you've got lgd there now so it's gonna be a little bit different with uh vici as the top team in china is gonna be there i expect rng to win the minor so there's gonna be four chinese teams in uh <laughs> at this major no bias by the way I all right swear. that's an incredibly um, bold call but I'll let, I'll let it slide secret will win everything and then yeah I, I wonder if secret's gonna hold this momentum coming in uh alliance are there but after alliance's performance at esl do they really have the confidence coming into this gambit i feel like they're a bit of a wild card they've got good players on that team we'll see how they perform overall but uh, you'll have EG with their full lineup, forward with their full lineup. I don't know if Secret win the major, and I think this one with full lineups from EG forward, having LGD come into the mix, and 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 seeing you know Fnatic come into the mix as well. Like we can really see this tournament be completely different, and it's going to be pretty exciting to see them just like just see this tournament with all these teams coming in with their full lineups and ready to go and some of them having experience coming into this season so like secret yeah. who are going to have the momentum coming in and, and virtus pro who always perform relatively well 
Vici just came in second. Aster still finding themselves. LGD is a top team that we expect to perform well as well. Like there's a lot coming into the KO major with uh, 16 teams. That's going to be uh, yeah. Really one thing is certain it's going to be a bloodbath um for me i mean I, I mentioned it before but i'm fairly um confident in saying that evil geniuses are my favorite uh lgd though i mean tied favorites i think it's going to be an eg lgd final that's the only thing i'm, I'm confident on who's going to take it uh, I, I don't know i don't know obviously we haven't seen much from lgd recently but um yeah i'm it, it's it's going to be exciting for sure um i'm hoping that forward um that Aster. And if complexity make it through, and alliance as well, these are teams which are which are doing things a little bit differently, which I always like, and I hope they do well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just using my head, I, I think it's EG and uh, LGD, which are going to be um, in the end there. Which is funny because they're two teams which weren't anywhere close to the finals of this uh, tournament. So, uh, pigeon, what about yourself? What are your predictions coming into the Kuala Lumpur major with the ending of Hamburg? I mean, I I've got a stick with secret. Like they've been looking, mm -hmm. they took the right approach, they relaxed. They got to be feeling confident. They are looking like the favorites right now. Um, other than that, like EG, sure, like EG's gonna do well. I still expect Ford Gaming to be up there. Like top yeah. four at least. I can easily see that. Mm -hmm. Uh outside runner, definitely Alliance. Alliance do have this spicy approach to Dota that is old school, weirdly enough, and innovative at the same time. It's kind of like because they refuse to let go of what Alliance is known for, they're kind of kept in the past while yeah. being relevant in the present. I mean, you got like, you got Loader as your coach, and then you got the new blood yeah. coming in, so it's kind of like this mingling of the old and the new. Definitely a joke I mean, to be made there give, somewhere, but I have to give them credit, especially like the most impressive thing I've seen from them recently is I haven't seen any team consistently shut down mids as well as Alliance. The only All problem right. is once you anticipate that. It becomes a weakness because if you overinvest in shutting down the mid, your other lanes suffer. Right? It's the same mm -hmm. logic as which made Wind Strike and Flight to Moon very strong for a long time. Is this kind of presence focused down Iceberg, left Silent alone for ten minutes, then Silent was the problem. And Iceberg still got farmed. Right? So when you're dealing with the highest caliber of teams, I'm not sure whether it's going to cut it anymore. You know, and I say this because this is the team that, especially when every game had a freaking alchemist in, Alliance were remarkable at shutting down the alchemists. The rotations, but it wasn't just the heroes they picked, it's the different ways they played them. So I think Alliance could contend, they just need to check themselves. Like That's the biggest, I think they're the worst, their own worst enemy. Like I think that's the way to look at Alliance right now. Okay, interesting. So, uh, yeah, your number one pick, um, let's just go through them all quickly again. Uh, mine is EG. Uh, Ben's is... LGD, did you decide on? Yeah, I think I'm going to go with LGD. Okay, Four and uh, Pigeon goes for Secret. So, uh, we'll see if any of those come to tuition. But from us today, uh, that's going to be it. Any, any final words on uh, Hamburg or what's, what's coming up in the future, guys? I think this season's getting underway. I'm ready to see this minor. Um, I'm ready to see what these teams that are just on the cusp of being a major team have to show to us. And I'm excited for RNG to take the minor with uh, <laughs> most most people are just like trying to Google right now who is RNG. I think RNG. Adam Stack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, Pigeon. Any 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 last words from you? Um, wish I had been there. Wish I wasn't dead. Wish I. The other events probably try and sort of ticket to Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> wish I was cool. there. Wish, wish I wish was, I was there. Melancholy wish from Pigeon. Wish I was screaming, "Yes, another Chinese team is losing, and Ben is crying." <laughs> yes, just yes! sending yes! Ben yes! selfies with your that's little why, finger. That's why we need to show up to events together because that's like your favorite part when you watch me just get set. I feel like you were. Yeah, these two get spicy. Be a ti. These two get spicy. It's brilliant. So good. Alrighty yeah. then, Pigeon and Vcop, thank you so much for joining me on the Caps and Log podcast. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it, uh, reviewing all the goings on of ESL 1 Hamburg. That is going to be it from us, but if you did enjoy the podcast, and please do let us know if you have any comments or feedback. Again, let us know. Don't forget to follow these two and myself on Twitter. We will be back on this channel on Wednesday where we will be interviewing Mr. Shane uh, regarding what happened in ESL 1 Hamburg, what's going on in uh, Sweden at the time, and of course, just finding out about the wonderful 
wonderful man and things he's been getting up to. But for now, we're going to say goodbye and we shall see you next time.